Good morning, um, again. It is a great pleasure to be a part of SOAP and to see SOAPers once again. Um, I'm here because this particular conference provides a great opportunity to learn. First of all, you learn from the speakers while um, listening to their talks or being involved in workshops. Then you learn from the people I now see in front of me, the audience. And uh, thirdly, if you are lucky enough to be one of the speakers, you learn when you explore the matter of your talk. Therefore, I would like to say thank you all for coming, for taking part in SOAP, and thank you, SOAPers, for organizing this outstanding and extraordinary event. So a round of applause for the conference. Um, as far as I know, um, the process of learning, well, actually, the whole point of my talk is that it is good and it is good to learn, and you should and can learn from everything around you. And um, as far as I'm concerned, the process of learning gets extremely productive and uh, efficient if you learn from something that is way out of your comfort zone. And this is one of the things that I like about SOAP as well. It's diversity, diversity of people, diversity of opinions, diversity of uh, things that you can actually learn. And uh, there are always things in in that can be applicable in Yan. Um, for example, give me a second. For example, although I'm not a mathematician, there might be mathematicians in the audience, I take great interest and pleasure in learning things about mathematics and arithmetics. My team is here and they know them, that I'm quite bad with numbers. It takes me some time to uh, sum up two numbers and it's has always been an issue for me. But um, a couple of weeks ago, I made a great personal discovery while practicing my sort of not really good mathematical skills. Um, as you probably know, we all come from various countries and we have relatively different surnames, which we inherit from our parents and they inherit from their parents and so on and so on. And it doesn't take too much for you to understand that we all have, well, the majority of us have two parents, uh, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32, um, 64, 128, 256, 612, 1,000, 4,000, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then in a few generations, you have thousands of ancestors, each one of whom is as responsible for your existence as the other. If you go back in time and plug one of them out, at least one person, you cannot exist. And um, in a few generations, in a few generations, you have more ancestors going back there than the population of Europe. So if you have Polish, Hungarian, uh, German, or indeed Ukrainian blood in your veins, then you must be related to Stefan Batory. And uh, basically, all I wanted to say at the outset is, uh, hello, brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, and um, another thing that is, um, in my view, the most important is that we can learn from each other. And let's do it. Um, let's learn something about distributed content creation. So my talk, my talk is based on a story of what a linguist may learn from a software developer. Um, it actually contains a summary of what I've learned when I worked, first of all, as a technical writer with the distributed systems. I was obviously writing about them. And at that time, I did not have any proper understanding of what they are, how they work, and what it, is, what it takes to create something big, something for billions of users, where tons of computers cooperate on a single issue, trying to solve one problem, one mutual problem. Um, basically, that was me with my first um, distributed system, and um, it only, I only got any sort of grip of what a distributed content, uh, distributed computing system is when I started building my own system, distributed content creation system. Um, I was doing that with my team, so we learned a lot, and. Uh, uh, the rest of the talk is based on what we learned. I will start with uh, providing oops, 
yeah, that's not my team, sorry. Uh, I will start with providing um, relevant definitions for both uh, distributed system and um, distributed computing system and both um, distributed content creation system. Mainly because um, I strongly believe that people can have a reasonable conversation only when they agree on the basic notions. Otherwise, otherwise you get into situations where you can argue forever, have arguments like people do in politics, philosophy, or marriage, or something like that. So, um, as you probably can see, a distributed system, computing system, is a group of computers that appear to the users as a single coherent system. Same is happening with the um, distributed content creation system, uh, where we have people instead of computers, and they work on a range of projects or on a single project. In our case, to make the example of my talk vivid and comprehensible, let's talk about an imaginary company who are dispersed across the world, but they still share the same knowledge base. They perform the following activities. So what they do is they write and read. And all that is happening simultaneously. And um, if you think why would anyone need documentation? These are the main reasons. These are not my inventions. These are the statements that I use to convince my, cus um, my customers, my stakeholders, that they need documentation. And um, it's not very hard for me to do that anymore because at a certain point in my company, everyone agreed that it is necessary and we have to have good documentation. But this is a functional requirement for our distributed content creation system. The main function of the system is to have the documentation. But today we're going to talk about um, another, another point of view. Um, we're going to talk about non-functional requirements. And what I mean by non-functional requirements as regards this system, content distributed, uh, distributed content creation, oh my god, this is killing me. Oh. So um, the non-functional requirement for this system would be how do you want this documentation? With pain or with ease? And uh, the story tells about um, what I learned from the software developers, how they do and how they make their, com uh, their computing systems easy to grasp, easy to manage, easy to maintain. So if you take a proper look, um, well, I'll start, I think I'll start with the example. Um, for me, um, a good example of um, a mass that can be brought into a distributed system is a disorganized meeting. I personally think that um, a disorganized meeting is a meeting without action points, without discussion point and points, and without people who take the responsibility for all that stuff. So if you don't have the three, these three items, um, you have a distributed system of people who are trying to do something together by they uh, but then at the end, they end up doing something completely irrelevant because what happens is that they do some stuff concurrently, they operate together, they think, they act, they try to do something, but it doesn't work because there is no synchronization between them. So it all happens concurrently. They have no global clock as to where the deadline is, as to what are they supposed to do and when, and Basically, they also fail independently. They don't have the possibility to communicate to each other properly. They lose the sense, they lose the project, and um, what it costs the company having these meetings is co the cost of all that stuff. Imagine a group of five people, each of who earns about $10 an hour, and they all come together, like five of, of them or seven of them, and they talk about some random stuff, and they walk out of this meeting without no comprehension of what is going on. And um, it also leads to some additional costs, like um, they're not doing their job. They are wandering around the office trying to get to this meeting point. Um, they spend lots of time complaining about the number of meetings they have, and um, they're trying to remember, when they finally get back to their places, they're trying to remember what they were doing before the meeting actually started and finished. And it all um, literally kills the process. And we all know where it leads. It leads to the worst thing ever. Anybody knows which thing? Well, I'll tell you. It's another meeting 
obviously. So they will have to meet again and again and again and until the point where they will synchronize, where they will arrange something that will help them. And this something came to me when I started analyzing um, distributed content creation system. Uh, and my experience was based on analyzing what uh, software developers do. So software developers have to act um, with these issues just as a meeting. So we have concurrency, we have no global clock, and we have independent failures. So the features, the features that help developers' systems to fight uh, these issues are as follows. So we've got heterogeneity, openness and scalability, failure, handling, concurrency, transparency, and security. So these are the features that um, are used to build a proper um, distributed system. So we're going to start with heterogeneity. To be honest with you, um, this all is, mm, how would you say that? So that stuff that is happening is the variety of different approaches, different networks, um, different computer hardware, programming languages, implement, and it all is implemented by various people. And for some reason, not for some reason, for some, they somehow have to cooperate and do something together. So, um, give me a second. And if you analyze that and look at a content, at a distributed content creation systems, um, you're going to have these problems. So if the developers have that stuff, so they've got different networks, different computer hardware, and so on and so on, we, as technical writers, have different writing style, different, different representation mediums, different documentation culture, and different tools, which leads to, to a mass. And um, what helps us in technical writing, as well as in software development, is these things. Uh, software developers apply internet protocols, middleware, and mobile code. So if you apply the, the same stuff in technical communication, you're going to end up with this. So I regard internet protocols as conventions, style guides, and templates that we use to help different people from different companies, from different offices, from our own company, to write something very similar, something that can be in, inserted into a single system. So these are the uh, stuff you can apply. So then middleware, in terms of middleware, is not a very good example, but for me, middleware is not an application, but something that unites us all together. So if we have consistent vision, consistent logic, consistent terminology, this is our middleware. This is something that allows one person, one technical writer, or not a technical writer, a developer, to see the things from one perspective and to act um, simultaneously, having consistent vision of, of the stuff. So this is, this is our uh, solution for that stuff. Mobile code. Mobile code is, is, a, is a type of code that you can transfer to another application that can be read by something that you did not write um, as a software developer. So in technical communication, our solutions would be similar tools vision and guidance, and experience exchange. By similar tools, I mean, like, in our company, we have lots of documents called uh, game balance. And these are the documents that determine how well or how difficult uh, the system responds to the user, to the player, in our case. So if we use um, Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets, uh, that means that we can transfer the information from one source to another, being mobile code. And then we have vision and guidance. Um, in our company, not only technical writers write the documentation. We have software developers joining us. We have game designers. We have people from various backgrounds doing the same stuff, writing documentation. And then it, all, it is all being shared. So it is vital to share your experience as a technical writer to people for, uh, who help you create this documentation. And experience e exchange is one of the things that are necessary to achieve consistency in vision as well. So basically, when you, as a technical writer, provide the people who are supposed to provide you with the information, you uh, make things better, and this is very important. Next uh, feature 
of um, a distributed content system is openness and scalability. These things are a bit vague, so we're going to need some time to sort of dis discuss them. Um, openness in um, technical communication can only be achieved if you have things that allow anyone from outside your office, not even be, uh, being previously involved in the project, to come in, get the grip of what's happening, and start doing his or her own stuff. And this um, is our guides. This is our workflows that we describe and let people know how things are happening in our company. And if you talk about uh, scalability, yeah, um, we have processes. Processes allow us to adopt new members, new um, teams, and new projects. And what I'm talking about is when you have no experience, you will have to, like, I'll give you an example. That would be better. So imagine a new team is joining a project, and they are supposed to do the same stuff as the others. And uh, the first, first time it happens, it's usually a failure. So you have to write something down. What we do in our company is, like, with Jira, yeah? Um, we started doing Jira, and we started writing down all the failures that we did with, with that stuff so that the next generation of users could just apply our failures for their benefits. And this is happening with the um, new game. So previously we had failures, we got some experience, and now the next team just going to go take a look at our list of failures and not do them again. And failures. Um, any process in a computer network is sort of vague for, 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 for the opposite part. You never know when your, um, when your teammate is going to fail. And when you have people uh, dispersed across several offices, you don't know what's happening there. And this is also um, being exaggerated by the fact that different people fail in different ways. And it takes time to communicate. And the system, the process is going on and on and on. You cannot stop that. So our solution for that in technical communication would only be messaging. Um, and to do these messages, we have to have processes that allow us to detect failures, to mask failures, to tolerate failures, and recover from these failures. So what we do, we have various workflows, because the system develops concurrently with the edits, and the authors um, may write something while the system is changing, and it's getting out of date. So basically, if we arrange all these processes, we'll, we'll be fine. Otherwise, we're going to fail. And also, we've got, we got to do things together. We have to do things that we are supposed to do. So the authors should write, editors should teach, technical communicators should teach others how to do stuff. And readers, readers must provide feedback. Because I strongly support Apple's policy in terms of view of the system. If the system fails, it's not uh, the, um, the, the, the user is not to blame if the system fails. We have to adopt. But there is no way to know why the system fails and how it fails if readers do not provide comments. So we encourage every user in our company to provide us with feedback on every single document that we produce. And this allows us to address these issues very fast and on large scale. And then finally, transparency. Um, transparency is something that is achieved through communication as well. We cannot operate in a dark room. If you do not know what other people do, there is no way to help them. There is no way to act as a distributed content creation system altogether. There is no way that you can achieve this goal. And finally, finally, the security. Security is quite interesting because when you start a project, um, you do not really know about these things, and I didn't. And um, no one ever told me before we faced a problem. We grew from a little office as a company, and now we are about 2,000 people all over the world. And um, when you are a startup, you do not 
have to comply with um, international standards like ESO and so on and so on. And it all comes to you with time. But before you embark on this journey, I would like to pay attention to these things. First of all, information security management system. It sounds very bureaucratic and um, whenever, ages ago, whenever I was talking about things like that, I was regarded as a bureaucrat and, uh, oh, Anton, what are you doing? You don't need that stuff. This is just bureaucracy. It's all in the paper. Nobody needs it. Nobody checks it. But then at some point we grew up and um, we were acquired by another huge company and it turned out that all that stuff is very necessary. So be ready, as a technical writer, as a technical communication specialist, you should at least know what these are and how they operate. I would like to pay attention to um, the ESO standard and then to these two protocols, SOC1 and SOC2. These are the things that are required by investors, by banks, by the entities that will analyze your um, what's that, efficiency and uh, how your company operates. The next thing is processes. We had situations where people were leaving the company with all the documentation. That is not a joke. Imagine a person who was running tons of documents in a company, and then at some point he decided to leave, not letting his team lead about the stuff that he has got on his, for example, Google disk or something. And it takes 25 days for Google to delete uh, backups. And in, after 25 days, you will not be able to restore them back. So you are supposed, as a technical communicator, think about these processes, these procedures that help you secure your, secure your documentation. So even as a technical communication specialist, you have to think about these processes when you fire people and when you hire people, because otherwise you're just not secure. And this is it. And backup, back, backups um, in our company, due to the fact that we are growing very fast. There were nobody, there were nobody who was responsible for the, oh my God, what's happening? Um, so there was nobody who was responsible for the backups and uh, we didn't do them. And at some point we realized that there's one day a week that we can lose all the system, which brought us to the point where we decided to, to do that and to secure um, ourselves with the internal backups and so on and so on. So that's basically it. There you go. This is the way we um, approach technical communication in our office, and this is the way we create distributed content creation, um, content creation systems in our company. There you go. Any questions? Thank you, Anton. Guys, questions about distributed uh, content systems? Did I get it like, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite hard to pronounce. I was struggling yeah, all like the way. We, yeah, distributed computing and then, you know, content and software and all that. And then, like, in my head, it's like it mi gets mixed up. Um, I wanted to be sure that I got it right. Okay, you guys, questions? Hi. Um, Hello. I have a question not about distributed content creation, which is, like, I, I totally condone that. That's really nice. Um, at some point in your presentation, you said... Um, uh, that we believed after a certain while that good documentation was in fact needed, which leads me to assume that there was a position beca because of that before. So what were the challenges that people said, no, we don't need good documentation, and how did you overcome that? Well, um, could you please repeat that because it's what was not very loud. Just the final bit of the question, please. Oh, um, the, the you said that after a certain while, uh, you or the company kind of said that, yes, we need good documentation which leads me to assume that they did not say it before. Um, so what were the challenges and how did you overcome these challenges? To be honest with you, there were no challenges. Um, I would say they were not obvious for the people who I worked with. And um, we were lucky not to face the problems. We were lucky not to lose documentation. We were lucky not to face some charges from our investors and so on and so on. It just happened so that I managed to convince them to believe me, and it took me three years to do that before everything failed. And I still do not really know how to convince a person who never had issues with the documentation, like this stuff with backups. Oh, I don't have it anymore. So the backups stuff, yeah? That was a huge, um, I would say, success for me when we lost a couple of balanced documents, when we lost some um, documents that actually told us what, uh, how the system works. And that was the point. Uh, that was a good example for my bosses 
to pay their attention to the security and to the needs of good documentation. That was, you can only fail and show this failure to the bosses and then, then they might understand you. Otherwise, there is no way to convince anyone who had no, no troubles like that. Oh. I don't know how to do that. Okay, you just well. have to show, you have to be transparent. You have to show the failures. You have to show the results. Good examples and uh, obvious things. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we have one question here in front. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Hello. And in one point, you uh, had like masking failures. When you were talking about failures, you had a point like, about masking fa failures. But what did you mean by that? Is it like it's not a bug, it's a feature, or like something like that? <laughs> um, well, something like that, because at some point, these failures turn out to be um, things that we do not know what they are. And at some point, with, uh, with no documentation, we had issues where we didn't know how the game works. And that these are the failures. And things like you have three separate teams, like production teams, design teams, and support teams working on the same problem. But it turns out that none of them is capable of getting the information of how the system works. And this is the failure. This is when we had to investigate the code. We had to research the stuff and to do things from scratch. These are the failures. And no, none of them had a chance to communicate with each other. So they were just independently thinking that they know something about the system, but they didn't. So okay. this was the failure on one of them. And how did you manage to fix it? Like, when you had such kind of problems? No, we, just, uh, they, uh, we, we made them to research the stuff. They okay. had to s watch the code, analyze it, and then uh, do the, th the thing from, from scratch. And there's also th things that we still don't know how they work. Okay. But it's cool. <laughs> I understand you. Thank you. OK, we can afford one more question if there is one. OK, I don't think there are any more questions. Thank you, Anton. Welcome. It was really nice to look at.